to study each week. And to do that, you need to go to this website, uh, absg.adventist.org, and that way you can download the lesson material for that particular week, or you can actually go uh, and download the whole series of lessons for that quarter and print them out. So we just want to be sure that you understand you can get that material. It is good for you to do that because there is so much more uh, information in the lesson material than we're able to cover in the few minutes that we have uh, each morning. We're hoping that you had a good Christmas and uh, a safe one. And today we just uh, are ending this series, this whole quarter series on education. So we're on lesson 13 and uh, our title today is Heaven, Education, and Eternal Learning. Anytime that uh, we begin to talk about heaven, I get excited. I get excited because of all the possibilities. I get excited about the, our ability to learn and to understand the things of God in a way that we've never done before. So this morning before we start, I'm going to ask you to pray. Pray with me and for me that we can have a proper understanding of the lesson material and so, if you will, let us pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for the Sabbath hours that uh, we have to worship you in a very special way. We, we thank you for that divine appointment that you made at creation. And Father, we're here this morning to keep that appointment with you. And we thank you for this time that you've carved out in the week that we, we can just be with you. We can set aside the cares of the world and the issues of life and that we can just spend our time uh, thinking about you and studying about you and meditating about you. So this morning, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to fill us Open our hearts and our minds, Father, that we will have a proper understanding of the lesson material and how to apply this to our lives. So, Father, again, thank you. We solicit your presence here in Jesus' name. Amen. So, our uh, lesson overview today is uh, that any school can pass on a lot of good information, a lot of good practical and helpful knowledge, but what good does it do if a person were to gain all the knowledge yet lose eternal life? That's a very serious question. Uh, we tend, as human beings, to spend our lives uh, gathering stuff and, and material things and so on, uh, but here, in, as we start this lesson, uh, we're cautioned that we can gain knowledge, we can gain material things, and yet we can, use, we can lose our eternal life. And if we do that, we have lost really everything. This week, we're going to look at what inspiration tells us about the ultimate graduate school, a school that goes on forever and where we will be learning and growing mentally and spiritually throughout all eternity. Uh, it's kind of uh, amazing to me because I love to study, I love to research things, and, uh, but to think that we will be in heaven, we'll have the opportunity to study under the tutelage of Christ himself, of God himself, that we're going to be able to see and understand things that we're not able to do now. And that excites me, it excites me to think that we're going to be able to travel to places we can't even imagine. We're going to see things we can't imagine. We're going to learn things that uh, just seemed impossible at this time. So uh, I'm really excited about that. I'm really, really excited about that. So this week's lesson, we're going to look at what inspiration tells us about that ultimate graduate school. And that graduate school is really our experience in the heaven that God is going to create for us, those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior of our lives. Here our key text this morning is from 1 Corinthians 2.9. It says, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. You know, when I read this, my heart just uh, kind of skips a beat. Because when, when God himself uh, is telling us that eye has not seen, ear heard, nor have entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for, him, uh, for those who love him, that's exciting to me. That tells me that there's some dessert coming, you know, where we, we just know there's something special 
that goes beyond anything that we've seen, heard, or can even imagine. So here in our, uh, another question that gets asked uh, as we think about eternity, you know, are we roadkill or are we actually going, are headed toward eternal life? And that is, that's a good question. And uh, that question actually came from this particular uh, individual in the 1600s, a French writer named Blasé Pascal uh, was ruminating on the state of humanity. For him, one point was very clear. No matter how long a human being lived, and back when he lived, it, didn't, it wasn't that long, and no matter how good the person's life was, and life wasn't that great back then either, sooner or later, that person is going to die. And uh, so for Pascal, the, the most logical thing a person could or should find out is what fate awaits the dead. And he is astonished to see people get all worked up over things such as a loss of office or for some imaginary insult to his honor, yet they paid no heed to the question of what happened after they were to die. That's a good question, isn't it? And believe it or not, there's an incredible amount of confusion in the world today about what happens to us when we die. I know in going on to uh, the uh, internet and from time to time looking uh, at some Google uh, sites and also from uh, the uh, YouTube sites, uh, it is amazing to me that the, the ignorance that exists about what happens to people after they die. The scripture is very uh, plain on that. And, uh, but what, we, what we're concerned with about today is what is the fate, what is, what is going to happen to those people who have committed their lives actually to a God who loves them and who is willing to die for them. So here in John 3.16, very familiar verses for us, 3.16 and 17 in John, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now one of the things that I think is interesting is the wording here says that he so loved the world. He didn't so love the Baptists or the Catholics or the Seventh-day Adventists. He loved the world. Everybody who has ever existed, Jesus died for them, and their, their choice was to either accept that uh, or not. And so here in verse 17, it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Again, this word world means all of humanity. Men, women, children, everybody who breathes, who walks on the face of the earth, has an opportunity to be part of God's family. And Jesus came and died that we could have that opportunity. And I love this, verse 17, the very fact that God said he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come to point a finger at us and say, you're bad, you're going to die He came to save us. We were condemned. We had a death sentence hanging over us because of sin, and there isn't anybody who hasn't sinned, so we all have that death sentence. But Jesus, uh, God's Son, came and, and gave his life that we might be saved and have eternal life. This is an amazing thing. Uh, I just don't know uh, that we, we really appreciate that the way that we should. As a matter of fact, Ellen White writes in her writings, and she says that we should spend an hour of day considering Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. The very fact that he was willing to leave heaven, to leave his throne there, his, take his, his kingly robes off and come down to this earth, reduce himself to a single cell, be born in very humble, very humble uh, uh, lifestyle, uh, from a very humble family. And it just it's an amazing story. That's the Christmas story, isn't it? Uh, Jesus didn't come in a palace. He didn't come in with a lot of power. He came in, very, uh, in a very humble way. And uh, I think we should love that. We should love that. So here uh, in 1 John, Sunday's lesson, continuing in the fate of the dead. In 1 John 5.13, it says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, I like that. 
I really like that. So many people say, well, you know, you shouldn't really say that. You, you should not say that you know that you have eternal life. As a matter of fact, I, I was a critic of that at one time. You know, people would say, are you saved? And I said, ha, what do you, why do you ask me that kind of a question? Well, I got news for you. God's word says that we should know that we have eternal life. If we have put our lives in the life of Jesus Christ, if we have accepted his sacrifice for us, if we, if we are, have uh, agreed to follow him and live life like he wanted us to live, then we can have eternal life and we can know it because of the promises that have been made to us in God's word. It says here also, and, you, uh, and that you may uh, continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. I believe that, that when we accept Jesus, we need to continue uh, in that exercise. You know, some people think that when we come to Christ, that's the end. Actually, that's the beginning of the walk. Jesus himself says, you know, you need to pick up my cross and you need to follow me. Picking up his cross means picking up his lifestyle, picking up his way of thinking, picking up his way of living, picking up his way of talking, pick, picking up his way of dealing uh, with other people. As a matter of fact, Jesus makes a statement in the, in the scriptures. He says, if you don't love me more than your mother or your father or your children or, or anything, if you don't love me more, then you don't deserve to be one of my disciples. That's kind of a serious, very serious statement. But you know, eternity is a very serious thing. And hell is a very serious thing. And we need to understand that there are decisions that need to be made. And depending on that decision that we make, it will be one of eternal life or eternal destruction. And we need to understand that. So here again in 1 John 5, 13, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So this is not a one-shot deal where you just come to say, well, I, I believe in Jesus, I believe that he died for me, and so on, and that's the end of the story. That's the beginning of the story. That's the beginning of the walk. Believe me, the walk with Jesus is deep. The walk with Jesus is serious. The walk with Jesus is beautiful. And we need to understand that. Uh, in John uh, 6.40, it says this, And this is the will of him who sent me. This is Jesus speaking, by the way. And so he says, And this is the will of him, this is the Father who sent me, Jesus, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in the last day. The I here is Jesus. He's saying, you believe in me? If you believe that the Father has sent me, if you believe in me and the mission that I have, I will raise you up in the last day. You may die a physical death, but he says that's not important. What's important is I have given you a promise that I will raise you in the last day. And that last day may be a month from now, it may be six months from now, it may be a year, it may be a hundred years, it may be a thousand years. When I think of all the believers who have died, especially during the middle evil age, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, for them when Jesus comes, it, for their sleep, however they manage to die, they will wake up and it will be as if it was a second of time. They will have no reckoning of time. It will be such an amazing thing. And, and for that reason, we should not be afraid of death. We should not be afraid because of the precious promises that we have that Jesus has made to us, that the Father has made to us, that there is a future for us no matter what happens to us here on this earth. As we continue here, uh, in Sunday's lesson, it said the New Testament becomes laced I like that word, comes laced with promises of eternal life. Eternity uh, alone can balance all the things out and then some. And what this is saying is the world is a miserable place. Terrible things are happening to people. Terrible things have been happening to people ever since sin came into this world. But he says, listen, eternity is going gonna, is gonna to wash and scrub that away. And, and when we look back, we're going to say, that whatever we had to do, whatever we had to give up, whatever experience that we deem was so awful, it will be 
nothing compared to what is being offered to us in the way of eternal life. And so infinitely so. Pascal was right. Our time here is so limited in contrast to what is coming. How silly not to be ready for the eternity that awaits us. You know, today, today we're, we just are frivoling, frivolous uh, as, as we live our lives, we, we just are wasting away and not really putting uh, our, our resources to work to uh, further God's work and his mission. He's given us a chore to do. Not only has he given us a chore to do, to reconcile others to him just the way we were reconciled to him, but he gives us this chore, this, this responsibility to be reconcilers. And, and so we now have this responsibility to be between God and those people, sharing the good news of the gospel, bringing them into a relationship uh, with Jesus and the Father. How do we do that? It's by how we live. It's how we talk. It's how we work. It's how we do everything that will be an attraction to bring people into a position to ask questions and want to be a part of God's family. As we start Monday's lesson, it's titled A New Existence. One of the things we have to realize is that when Jesus comes back and, and uh, he's, he's going to create a whole new world and all of the evil and the nastiness of this world, all the pain and the hurt and the tears, all of everything that just hurts us will be going away. And so here in Revelation, uh, we find that in, in Revelation 21, 4 says, And God will wipe away every tear from every eye. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. And then in verse, 20, or verse 21, 5, it says, then, who, then he who sat on the throne says, Behold, I make all things new. I got news for you. That's good news. In other words, the world that we walk in today is going to be destroyed. Scripture says that it's going to be burned up. And so, you know, all the material things that we struggle for, that we spend all our time on, that we, we just uh, seem to uh, have loved so much, all of those things are going to go up in smoke. But God says here, behold, I make all things new. He's going to make this earth over again, and it's going to be pristine. It's going to be like it was originally, maybe even better, uh, considering the fact that, that we've experienced what we've experienced uh, through God and with God, that uh, I believe that, that this is going to be an amazing, incredible, awesome place. As a matter of fact, Scripture says that our minds can't even conceive of it. I, I just, when I think that way, it just, it takes my breath away because I want to be there and I want to experience that. I want to experience it just as much as I can experience it. Here in uh, our next slide, it says a Christian was talking to a friend about the hope of the gospel, the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. The person responded negatively to the whole idea. Eternal life, he said with a shudder. What a horrible thought. Our 70 or 80 years here are bad enough. Who'd want to stretch this out forever? That would be hell. What this individual doesn't understand is that Jesus is going to make everything over again. He's, 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 we're not going to have a 70 or 80 year old decrepit body. You know, as I, I'm, I'm in, in just a few days, I'm going to be turning over a new year. Is it 78 now? 78. So I, I can honestly tell you that with each year, I, I become more and more aware of my mortality. You know, when I was a young fellow, I th thought nothing could ever happen to me, even though I saw a lot of my friends fall by the wayside. I just, within me, I felt like, you know, nothing can touch me, nothing can hurt me. And yet, I've lost a lot of friends through all of the years. But now that I'm 77, going to be 78, I realize how fragile life is. It's just a thin thread, and it's controlled by my God. So is it going to be something, a horrible thought, that we're going to live for eternity? Absolutely not, because there will be no more achy bones. 
You know, there, there won't be any more headaches. There won't be any more arthritis. There's not going to be any more pain, no more cancer. Uh, and, and old age is not going to attack our bodies like it does now. So this individual who thinks that uh, being, living eternal, eternity uh, is going to be a horrible thing, it's going to be hell, I'm going to tell you it's not going to be hell. It's going to be heaven. It's going to be heaven. As a matter of fact, it will be hell for some people because I'm telling you that if you don't, if you don't love the things of God now, you, you would, if you went to heaven, you would be in hell. Can you imagine living in hell for eternity, hating the whole time that you were there and hating God and hating all of the people who love God? That would indeed be hell, but that's not what's planned. The people who don't love God are not going to survive. The scriptures tell us that if they haven't placed their trust in God, if they haven't placed their trust in Jesus Christ and his shed blood, they are not going to exist through the, uh, the judgment time. They're, they will be destroyed. So let's go on here. In 2 Peter 3.9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. You know, that's an amazing thing about God. Some... Through the years and the centuries, the medieval church actually created a picture of God that was mean and ugly and ornery, always having his finger out there, always pointing, always condemning. The, the medieval church did a terrible disservice to God's character, just like the Jewish nation did a terrible uh, thing to God's character. It says here that he is long-suffering, he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away and with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. I got news for you. That's a promise. And when that promise comes from God, that's exactly what's going to happen. But I think what we should focus on here is that God does not want anyone to have to die in that destruction. He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How do people come to repentance? First of all, there has to be an awareness that they are sinful people. You know, we're all sinful. But we have, if we have chosen to accept the gift of life from Jesus Christ himself, then we are on safe ground. The people who are sinners and have not done that, they will have to pay the price for their own sin. This is the thing. Jesus has said, I'll pay that price for you. I will redeem you. The person who doesn't accept Jesus has not, does not have that guarantee. They're going to have to pay the price themselves. And so this is, this is a, a thing that we need to understand. So as we continue here in Revelation 21.1, uh, it says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, for God prepared as, from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So here we need to understand that God is going to actually move the seat of his government to this earth. That's pretty amazing. In other words, that's another thing that just blows my mind. God wants to be with us. You know, if you remember the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, one of the, just almost immediately, God said to Moses, I want you to build me a house, a tent, that I can be there with you. I want to be among the people. And, and he gave very explicit, very, very detailed instructions about how that was going to be built and how it needed to be done. Now, what was interesting is that he asked for some craftsmanship. He asked for craftsmanship that didn't exist. And, and so, you know, I'm sure this puzzled Moses to some degree. You know, I, I know these people, and I, I, know they, I know they're pretty smart, and they can do a lot of stuff, but they can't do this. But see, here's the nice thing about God. When he says something and asks us to do something, he already enables it. So he already had already put his hand on certain craftsmen, and he said, this person is going to do this, this person is going to do that. I am the one who's giving them the ability to do that. And they made some magnificent, amazing things as a result. 
Again, how did they do that? God enabled it. He empowered it. He made it happen. And that's the beautiful thing about God. He makes things happen. He doesn't tell us to go do something. He doesn't tell us to obey him and then not give us the ability to do that. He does that. That's the beauty of the God that we serve, a loving God who wants us to succeed. Here as we continue in 2 Peter 2.10, actually it's 3.13, I'm having a problem reading. It says, nevertheless, we according to his promise look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. This is another beautiful thing about the story that we're told about the new Jerusalem. There's not going to be anything ugly that's going to be in that, that place. There will be no sin. There will be nothing but righteousness there because God himself is going to dwell there with us. Uh, and it says here, uh, as we continue, it says the important question for us in all of this is, what does it take to be part of this new existence? What things in our life, if any, could stand in the way of our being part of what God has promised us through Jesus. You know, we need to be careful. It is so easy. It is so easy for us to let the things of this world, it's so easy for us to let the cares of the world, it's so easy for us to let uh, the, the idea that we have to have this or we have to have that or, you know, I, I need to accomplish this or I need to accomplish that. If you put your life in God's hands, he'll see to it that you accomplish what it is that you're supposed to accomplish. You know, if you, if, if you are to, to have a degree, he'll help you do that. You know, you have to want it. You have, may have to work towards that. But nonetheless, the idea here is that God wants you to be happy. He will do things for you. But if you put your hand in his hand, he's going to lead you in a way that you will really be pleased with your life. So, what is it, you know, the question is asked, what is it that can stand in the way of our really being a part of God's family? Uh, what's going to stand in the way of our actually experiencing eternal life? What's going to, what can stand in the way of our actually experiencing heaven? I hope that there is nothing, nothing. You know, and it may be that we need to take an inventory from time to time in our devotions. We, need to may, we may need to ask God, God, uh, you know, I'm kind of blinded to spiritual things. Why can you please show me the things in my life that need to be corrected so that I can always walk with you, that I can walk close to you, that, I can, that you can become, you can come inside of me and that you will be a part of me. And that we will be so close together that I will always feel your closeness to me. I will feel you walking with me. I think that's the kind of relationship that God really, really uh, wants to have with us. As we continue here in Tuesday's lesson, uh, titled, Then Shall We Know, it says uh, here, Heaven is a school, its field of study, the universe, its teacher, the infinite one, a branch of the school was established in Eden, and the plan of redemption accomplished. Uh, uh, education will, uh, again, be taken up in the Eden school. This is Ellen White writing in uh, Education, page 301. Here's the thing. When God created the Sabbath, he was creating time for the human family to come and set aside the cares of the world and to meet with him in a special way. That doesn't mean that God doesn't meet with us every day in, in everything that goes on in our lives. And I got, I've got to give a little testimony here. I, I, was, uh, uh, I had gone to bed last night and it was in the middle of the night and, I, and all of a sudden this voice came to me and said, uh, you have moved the files from one folder, the Sabbath school folder, uh, and into another folder, and the AV people are going to need that in the morning. Now, this came out of the clear blue, and I'm thinking, what? And then I thought about that in a minute, and I had done that. And what I do is when I prepare a Sabbath school lesson, I put that, in, that lesson material into a folder, and it is titled Current Sabbath School uh, Lesson. I have another folder that says Previous Sabbath School Lesson. And so what I do is once that lesson has been used, I moved it over to the other folder just to save it. And so I can use it for reference at another time. 
But in this case, I had been working on two lessons at the same time. And just like clockwork, the way that I always do it, I had moved the information about the lesson, the first lesson, lesson 12, I had moved it out of the folder and put it in the, I hadn't even, we haven't used it yet, but I had done that. And it didn't dawn on me. In the middle of the night, this voice comes to me and says, you've done this. And I'm thinking, what? Not possible. And then I thought about it and I said, I did that. Now, what's interesting is all through the night, this is in my head, right? And, and so in the morning, the first thing I did, I got up, I went in, turned the computer on, uh, put my thumb drives back in and, and corrected the problem. But I'm thinking, where did that information come from? Out of the clear blue. I didn't even know that I had done that. But somebody did. My God knew. My God knew. Now, whether he sent an angel to speak to me or however it happened, I'm telling you the voice was as clear as you speaking to me. And, and, and so that said two things to me. God not only cares about me, but he cares about what we do and how we do. He did not want me to come here today and create confusion for the AV people. He said, you, you need to get this straightened out, and I did. And I praise God for that. I, you know, I don't know how that happens. I don't know how these voices come. I just know they do. And that tells me something about my God and how he does business and how he wants to walk with me. He wants to talk with me. He wants to live with me. This is why he had the children of Israel build this tent right after they had come out of 400 years of slavery. He said, I, these are my people and I want to be with them. Amazing. God, the one who spewed the cosmos, he wanted to be with this motley group of slaves. What an amazing story. Amazing story. I got news for you. We're still slaves. You know, we're still slaves. We're living in, in a land of slavery to Satan. But God wants to take us out, and he's made promises to us. And he wants to live with us, and he wants to abide with us. He, he wants to be a part of our home and our families. He wants to be a part of our work. He wants to be a part of everything that we do because he loves us. He loves us. Let's go on here. Continuing in Tuesday's lesson, it says here in 1 Corinthians uh, 13, 12, For now I see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part but then I shall know just as I also am known. Here, in this verse, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he says, listen, we can't see everything that there is to see. We can't. We can't see it. We're not, we're not seeing the God the way he is, the way we should see him. We're not, we're, it says right now, we're, 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 now we see in a mirror dimly. But then, when Jesus comes, we're going to see face to face. We're going to see the way things really are. And that excites me. He says, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. So I, 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 I take it from these verses that even in God's heaven, we're going to know who each other is. We're going to know each other in a way that we have never known each other before. This is amazing. This is amazing. I believe we're going to see people and know them, even people that we didn't know. There's going to be something about these people that's going to just come forth into our knowledge, and it's going to be a beautiful thing. I believe there are no strangers. I don't believe there will be any strangers in heaven. No strangers in heaven. Because the God who made us, I believe, will connect us in a way that we cannot even imagine. Let's go on here, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. It says, therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Then each one's praise will come from God. So what's happening here, again, Paul speaking to the Corinthian church, he says, you know, sometimes we think we know. We think we know. But Paul says, listen, you don't know. You really don't know. So he says, don't judge anything before the time. 
Who is the judge? Our God is our judge. Jesus is going to be the judge. And so Paul is saying, don't, don't become a judge and, and take it upon yourself. Uh, because Jesus, the Lord, is coming who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. And so we need to understand. So then it says, then each one's praise will come from God. It's amazing what the scriptures tell us. It's amazing what these scriptures tell us about think, how things are going to be. And yet they don't tell us enough. I, I, my ears perk up every time I read something that, that makes me feel like, you know, it's an inspired word. Uh, I read some of Ellen White's writings about her, her experiences, and, and, and it just amazes me. You know, she, she says that the beauty of what she has seen is so amazing that to come back into an experience on this earth is, is to seem like you're going into a dark room. Can you imagine what it's really going to be like to see what heaven is really like, to see what God's new creation is going to be like, to, to understand the brilliance, you know, we're seeing now through a dim and dark mirror. But one day, we're going to be able to see things the way they really are. So we need to understand that. We really, we really need to understand that. Here we go, uh, we are promised that we will be given understanding of things that for now remain hidden to us. What a wonderful hope, too, that once we do see the, uh, and understand the things that now seem so difficult, we will have nothing but praise for God. The key for us now is to hold on to our faith, trust in God's promises, live up to the light that we have, and endure unto the end. And the good news is that we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. Strengthens us. And that's Philippians 4.13. You know, we ought to have that tattooed. Not that we, Scripture talks about against tattooing. Uh, and piercing, but I, I think uh, I'm, I'm think the Lord would forgive us if we put that one on the top of our hand, so that it would be forever uh, before our eyes. I uh, I'm just amazed. I uh, was watching uh, a series, uh, uh, an interview on YouTube, and it was titled "Mathematics and Darwin." And there were three people in this uh, conversation. There was a, a philosopher, there was a computer genius, and then there was a mathematician. These people were all excelled in their field. And they were talking about Mar uh, Darwin's theory. And, and not one of these men could, could accept creation. But here's what they said. The philosopher says, there is no way after we have looked and we now have the research and the equipment to see, there is no way that the theory of Darwin could really ever uh, be plausible. It can't be. So then they, they talked about that for a while, and then, uh, and, and the reason he said, he said that these little proteins uh, that make up life, he said, each of those proteins have a, a, a life in, within them. There are little machines, and he said for that protein to find another protein that they could mate up with and actually uh, create something that are so remote that there isn't enough time, there hasn't been enough time in Earth's history and never will be enough time. So he goes to the, the, the computer genius and he starts talking about the genetic code and all of the characteristics of that. And he basically says the same thing that the philosopher does. So then they go to the mathematician, and the mathematician, who just loves numbers, and he begins to expound all this stuff in numbers, and he basically, the, the commentator says, come on, boil this down so I can understand it. He says, okay, there isn't enough time in world's history, even if you count it in billions of years, or in the future billions of years, there is not enough time for such a thing to happen as evolution. And I'm thinking, wow, isn't that amazing? They couldn't accept creation as it is written in God's word, but they, also, but they acknowledge that there is no way, there is no way that this could happen at all. But there is a way. When God creates, it happens. He speaks and it happens. So, 
Soon we will have an understanding of things that have been hidden from us. The key for us now is to hold on to our faith, trust in God's promises, live up to the light that we have, and endure to the end. And the good news is that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So that's good news. All our pain, all our suffering, all the things that we struggle with here come from sin and the consequences of sin. Christ came to undo all of that, and he will restore the earth to what God originally had intended it to be before sin. These glories we will forever be able to behold, the scars on Jesus' hand and feet, the cost of our redemption. I don't know if you really understand what will happen to us, those of us who have gone through this insanity here on this earth, those of us who have, have, have looked to God to save us from this craziness, those of us who've looked to Jesus' blood to save us, uh, I, I think that you need to understand that we will probably be ambassadors to the heavens, to the cosmos, for only we can tell the story. Even an angel can't tell that story. You know, there's a song, I believe, that says the angels have to fold their wings, you know, when the story of the gospel is told, when the, when the story of, the, of, of our life on this earth, uh, struggling with sin, what it's been like. Even the angels cannot tell that story. Um, here in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 4.17, it says, For our light affliction... Now, this is interesting, coming from the Apostle Paul, talking to the Corinthian church. Paul, who's been beat up, imprisoned, uh, just everything you can imagine, stoned, everything, everything awful that could happen to a man has been happening to him. But he says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. See, he recognizes, you know, on that Damascus road, I believe Jesus showed him everything from Genesis to Revelation. And, and here he's saying, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So he's saying, listen, don't, don't worry about what's happening, happening to you right now. Don't, don't put your focus on that. Put your focus on eternity. Put your focus on eternity. You know, every time we, we do anything, it should be in the light of eternity. Everything we do should be in the light of eternity. Here in Revelation uh, 2, 7, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will uh, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So this is kind of an interesting verse, but he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And he says, he who overcomes. How do we overcome? We don't overcome by grabbing our bootstraps and pulling, them, pulling ourselves up. We can't do that. When we're talking about spiritual things, we need to win the victory spiritually. And the only way we can do that is through our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be open to his spirit. We need to be, we need to be open to the, the infilling that should come to us every minute of every day. And that's the only way that we will ever overcome. Here in our next uh, notice is however real the promises offered us in Jesus, however many good reasons we have to believe in them, the fact remains that the Bible gives us just hints and glimpses of what awaits us. You know, that, that's the problem. I, I, I love to read and see pictures. You know, paint, write me a picture. And, and that's what a good book is for me. When I'm reading a book and, they're, and it's written in such a way that I can visualize what it is that I'm reading. And, and we just get, we don't get quite enough hints about uh, this uh, business of eternal life and what heaven is going to be like. But we're going to have to trust God. Trust him. When he says that our eyes can, has never seen our mind can't conceive, our ears haven't heard. 
we need to trust him that that is real, that he really means what he's saying there, that, that heaven is going to be absolutely an incredibly amazing place. A central aspect of Christ's ministry here on earth uh, was, set, was, was, was that of a teacher. And that is true, isn't it? Every time we read about Jesus, he was somewhere teaching. Teaching, preaching, for the most part, it was always in a teaching setting, whether he was in, a, in the synagogue, uh, in the temple, out on a mountainside somewhere, wherever he was, he was always teaching. He says, from the beginning of his history, whether through acts or deeds, Jesus was constantly teaching his followers truths about himself, about the Father, about salvation, and about the hope uh, that awaits us. Now, what's amazing is that because the disciples were so tempered by tradition, a lot of the things that Jesus said just kind of wafted right over their heads. You know, he was saying this, but they were seeing this. Why? For tradition, tradition, tradition. Tradition, they were so steeped in tradition, they could not get it through their head that Jesus was not the warrior king that they had been thinking the Messiah would be. As a matter of fact, the, the, the religious leaders of the day just, you know, they jettisoned Jesus. They, you're not the Messiah. You don't look like the Messiah. You don't act like the Messiah. And they didn't understand that the Messiah, in the context of God's word, he was going to picture who, Jesus, who the Father was. That was his mission, to save the lost and to paint a picture, a correct picture of the Father. So this is kind of an amazing thing. Here in Luke 19.47, uh, talking about the great teacher, it says, and he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the leaders of the day sought to destroy him. What? I, every time I read these things about the religious leaders of the, day, of the day wanting to destroy Jesus, it blows my mind. How do you do that? How can you claim to be God's religious leaders and yet you are destroying anybody, whether it's Jesus or not? In this case, they had all the promises. They had all of the promise of the Messiah at their disposal. You know, three kings came from the, from the Orient to bow down to, the, to Jesus. And where did they get the information? They got it from the Word, you know? They got it from here. They knew, they knew what the prophecies were and when those prophecies were going to come to fruition. And they came. The religious leaders of the day were camped right there in the neighborhood. And what did they want to do? They wanted to kill Jesus as he grew up and began to minister. It's insane. But that shows you what happens when Jesus, I'm sorry, when, when Satan gets control of people's minds. There's no, no rationale uh, for their behavior. So, here in uh, Matthew 5.1, it says that seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. So here we see Jesus again, uh, you know, coming and teaching. And then in verse 2, it says, then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and so on. So we find, always find Jesus teaching. And I guess I begin to wonder, why is it the people were following Jesus? What, what was it about Jesus that was different than the religious leaders of the day? Why, why would hundreds and sometimes thousands of people, even though he was working miracles, there was something about Jesus and the way he talked, the way he, he described the Father, the way he talked about the kingdom to come and so on. There was something about Jesus that just drew people in to him. And I believe honestly that if we can learn to talk that way, we will draw people as well uh, through God's Holy Spirit, through the Spirit of Christ. So Jesus was always, always teaching. He was the great teacher. Now here's, uh, I couldn't help but, but put this slide in. Uh, in Zechariah 13, 6, it says, and one, will, and one shall say to him, what are these wounds on thine hands? Then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Isn't that sad? Jesus came to his own people. Jesus came to his own people, and they didn't know who he was. 
As a matter of fact, they ridiculed him. Even in his own town of Nazareth, he was ridiculed. You know, one minute they're praising him for the way he talks and the way he expounds the scriptures. One minute they're just patting him on the back and saying, man, you're great, whatever, whatever. Of course, in the corner they're saying, isn't this, isn't this jo- jo- Joseph's son? Isn't this Mary's son? How could it be that he has this kind of wisdom and so on and so forth? So you had two groups of people there. But then Jesus tells them something else. He begins to tell two stories, and in those stories, all of a sudden the people realize that he's really pointing a finger at them and saying, you are of little faith, and this is the reason that these miracles didn't happen here in your land. And, and don't you know, those people got so upset with him. They got so upset with him that they actually grabbed him and tried to throw him over a cliff there near the synagogue. How do you do that? One minute praising him for the way he talks about God and all of this, and then the next minute, because they don't like what he says, which was true, by the way, it was true. But they didn't want to hear it because it was truth, and they didn't want to hear truth. This is sad. And I, I, I just when I saw this Zechariah verse, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hand? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. How sad that God, the Son of God, would be treated this way by his own people, by his own people. And not only his own people, but the religious leaders of that day that were commissioned to share the good news of the gospel with the world. They were to be the missionaries for the world. They blew it big time. They really did, and that's sad, very sad. They didn't want to know the truth. You'll remember later, uh, Stephen was preaching to them uh, and about, uh, actually Stephen took them through their whole history, and, and they, you know, I'm sure everything was going fine until Stephen gets to the point and he says, you know, you're the ones who killed the prophets. You, you and your fathers are the ones who killed the prophets. And, and that made them so mad that they actually end up stoning him. So there again, they decided they did not want to hear the truth. So let's go on here. The years of eternity as they roll will bring richer and still more glorious revelations of God and of Christ. As knowledge is progressive, so will love, reverence, and happiness increase. The more men learn of God the greater will be their admiration of his character. As Jesus opens before them the riches of redemption and the amazing achievements in the great controversy with Satan, the hearts of the ransom will thrill with more fervent devotion. This is amazing. That's amazing. We we are not going to be bored in heaven. I can tell you that. We're not going to be bored, not at all. We need to close, and this is our closing slide. Most are unaware of a strange apathy that they live with. There are at least a dozen goals we have on on any given day, from doing chores to meeting deadlines. We are kept busy identifying those short-term ends and then pursuing the means to accomplish them. But when it comes to identifying the goal of life and the means to accomplish that, we freeze like the proverbial deer in the headlights. How is it that humans can be so concerned about the fate of their favorite sports teams but indifferent or apathetic to their own spiritual fate or that of their families? Jesus, desperate to break through this apathy, says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That's a good question that Jesus asks, isn't it? We need to close, and I would ask that you would pray with me as we do that. Father in heaven, thank you for the issues of this, this lesson. Thank you for the promise of heaven. Thank you for the, the, even the little snippets, the little pictures that we've gotten of what it's going to be like. Father, your word says that we can't even imagine that our eyes have never seen, our ears have never heard. Father, I, I, I'm just excited by those words, and so I just pray that wherever this voice is going today, that we will make a commitment, Father, to be on your side, on your team, on, in your family, believing in Jesus and, Father, in believing his life-saving blood. 
Father, thank you again for your love and your mercy. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.